Good afternoon, class. Today we're going to discuss Chapter 1, the Individual Income Tax Return, and provide an overview of important elements such as the individual tax formula, the tax calculation, who must file, filing status, and itemized and standard deductions. And so the learning objectives for Chapter 1 include uh, explaining the history and objectives of U.S. tax law, describe the different entities subject to tax and reporting requirements, applying the tax formula for individuals, identifying individuals who must file tax returns, determining filing status and understanding the calculation of tax according to filing status, defining qualifying dependents, calculate the correct standard or itemized deduction amount for taxpayers, compute basic capital gains and losses, access and use of various internet resources, and describing the basis, basics of electronic filing, e-filing. And so tax law history and objectives. Since 1913, when the 16th Amendment was passed, the constitutionality of the income tax has not been questioned by federal courts. The income tax serves a multitude of purposes, such as to raise revenue, to stimulate the economy, to reduce unemployment, to expand investment in um, productive capital assets, control inflation, and encourage certain business activities and industries. So to encourage taxpayers to undertake activities that benefit themselves and society. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, it was signed into law December 20, 2017, and it includes the following provisions. A reduction of the individual tax rates, increased standard deduction, suspension of personal exemptions, qualified business income deduction, a suspension of itemized deduction phase out, temporary cap on state and local taxes, uh, reduced limits on mortgage interest deductions, and increased child tax credit. And so the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 was the first major uh, a change to the tax system in, in, in a very long time. So the individual, most individual tax files, filers uh, file form 1040, which contains three possible schedules, schedule one, two, and three. So schedule one is additional forms of income, many deductions um, for adjusted gross income, schedule two, additional taxes, such as the alternative minimum tax, and schedule three, credits and payments other than withholding. In addition to schedule one through three, six schedules identify certain types of income and deductions that must be reported. And here you have your Schedule A uh, for itemized deductions, your Schedule B to report dividend income and interest, Schedule C for trade or business income, Schedule D for capital gains and losses, Schedule E to report rental or royal income, royalty income or pass-through income, and Schedule F to report farm and ranch income. The corporation is taxed at a flat rate of 21%. Uh, they need to file Form 1120. So Forms 1120-S is used by corporations that elect the S corporation status. It uh, does not generally pay regular corporate tax income tax. Instead, it passes through items of income and loss to shareholders. And so a partnership reporting entity, not taxable entity. So Form 1065 reports partnership income and loss and the allocation to a partner. And then that form is used to prepare a 1040 typically for the part in individual partners. And so the tax formula, which is this is very important, and I would um, make a copy of this slide or uh, write this information down so you can refer to it whenever you are using, whenever you need to calculate uh, problems in this chapter. And so here we have the tax formula for individuals uh, follows form 1040. And so you have your gross income, less deductions for adjusted gross income will give you adjusted gross income. Less greater of itemized deductions or your standard deduction less qualified business income deduction gives you a taxable income and then that is multiplied by the tax rate using appropriate tax tables or rate schedules and then that gives you a gross income tax liability and additional taxes less tax credits or prepayments and that gives you a total tax due or your refund so this pretty much follows the whole format of the 1040. so gross income uh, from the first item here. So gross income from all of the following are reported directly on the Form 1040. So that's your wages, interest, dividends, pensions, Social Security, and capital gains and losses. 
deductions for adjusted gross income. And so that's certain trade or business expenses, certain reimbursed employee business expenses paid under an accountable plan, uh, pre-2019 alimony payments, student loan interest, a penalty for early withdrawal from savings, uh, contributions to qualify retirement plans, and certain educator expenses all fall in the category under deductions for adjusted gross income. And so your adjusted gross income is referred to as AGI. It's sometimes referred to as the magic line since it is the basis for several deductions and limitations. And so basically that amount is used to determine whether you qualify for other deductions. So standard deduction or itemized deduction. And so the following table gives you the standard deductions for 2019. And so again, this is another table that you need that you would need to know. Um, it's less important as the first, um, the tax formula, because that's very important. But this one gives you that line item to determine whether you're going to use itemized or standard deduction. And so here you have the filing status, and then you have the standard deduction that follows um, the different types of filing statuses. And so additional amounts are also uh, allotted for blindness or over the age 65, 1650 for unmarried taxpayers, and 1300 for married taxpayers and surviving spouses. And then here for the standard deduction, you can see that filing single and married filing separately, are, uh, the standard deduction is very low as opposed to married filing jointly or even head of household. So exemptions. <clears throat> Prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, taxpayers received a deduction called an exemption for themselves, their spouses, and their dependents. Uh, exemptions were suspended in 2018 and will expire in 2025. And so the gross tax liability often often reference obtained by reference to the tax table or by use of the tax rate schedule. And so here we have a self-study problem. So Bill is a single taxpayer, age 27. In 2019, his salary is 29000 and he has interest and income of $1,500. In addition, he has deductions for adjusted gross income of $2,200. And he has 6,500 of itemized deductions. Calculate the following amounts. Here they're asking you to calculate his gross income, his adjusted gross income, um, the standard deduction or the itemized deduction, and then his taxable income. And so his gross income, you're going to take 29,000 of his salary plus the 1,500 of interest income, and that gives you 30,500. For adjusted gross income, you're not going to take the AGI minus any deductions. And remember, he, they said he had 2,200 in deductions. And so now his adjusted gross income is 28,300. Now for the standard deduction, you're going to choose 12,200 because it exceeds his itemized deductions of 6,500. And so when it comes to deductions, standard, standard deductions or itemized deductions, you're going to, you're going to uh, tabulate your itemized deductions but if they don't exceed the standard deduction that's going to be given to you based on your filing status, you choose the higher of the two. And so if you go back and remember the table, being single, this is his standard deduction, 12200 Now, he had itemized deductions of 6500 which which the 12200 was higher, so you would choose that. And so now, in determine his taxable income, you would take the 28300 which is his AGI, and you will... Uh, reduce that by his deduction that he chose and in, in this choice in this option the best one was the standard and so now his taxable income is 16,100 and to go further with that number you would then go find the go find his tax rate in the table multiply it and it'll give you actually his his uh his the tax amount and then you will go through the rest of the formula to determine whether he has a refund or he owes but in this problem they stopped at this point and so who must file? Several conditions must exist before a taxpayer is required to file a U.S. income tax return. The conditions are based primarily on the filing status and gross income. And so you can refer to the figures in these in 1.1, uh, 1.2, and 1.3 on pages 1, uh, 9, and 110 for a summary of the filing requirements for taxpayers in 2019. But typically, um, everyone that received income should file a tax return for a lot of times, not even if it's for the purpose of taxes, they you can use it for many other things. And so a taxpayer who is required to file a return must file a hard copy at the IRS campus processing site or e-file their return. 
And so generally do the 15th day of the fourth month of the year following the close of the tax year, which is normally April 15th. Um, if the 15th falls on the weekend, returns are due the next business day. And there's two exceptions listed here for Maine and Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. Uh, so this pretty much just describes that you you need to either, when they're saying a hard copy, you need to mail in an actual physical copy of your return or you need to e-file. And more and more um, people are e-filing. Just the majority of tax returns are done through e-file. And so single filing status. And so um, unmarried or legally separated as of December 31st, not qualified as married filing separately, head of household or qualifying widower. A married filing jointly. If married on December 31st, even if even if you didn't live together the entire year, if spouse dies during the year, file as married filing jointly in the current year. And so the way the IRS works, if you marry at any point during that year, you're considered married for the whole year. And the same with um, being divorced or legally separated under single fat, single status. If you divorce or separate any time during that year, as long as it's before December 31st, you, you qualify under that status. And so married filing separately, each files a separate return. They must uh, must compute taxes the same way. So both must itemize or both must use the standard deduction. If living in a community property state, they must follow state law. So sometimes state law, sometimes states have special laws uh, in community property states. And so, again, married filing separately is a, is a very um, high tax bracket to be in because your itemized deduction is so low. So head of household. And so unmarried or abandoned as of December 31st, you paid more than 50 percent of the cost of keeping up a home that was a principal place of residence of a dependent child or other qualifying dependent relative. And so there is one exception to the principal residency requirement. If the dependent taxpayer's uh, parent, he or she does not need to live with the taxpayer. And so head of household is a step up from single if you were if you were married or separated it's a step up from filing married filing uh single uh separate or filing single it's the deduction is a little bit higher but you have to meet this 50 percent um hurdle in order to qualify and so qualifying widower with a dependent child so you may continue to benefit from the joint return rates for two years after the death of of his or her spouse and so to qualify uh, to use joint return rates, a widower must pay over half the cost of maintaining a household where a dependent child, stepchild, adopted child, or foster child in certain situations lives. And so again, this is this is another uh, special uh, category that you must meet these requirements. And so tax computation. So for 2019, there are seven tax brackets, and these brackets depend on your um, the rates based on income level. And so you can be in the 10%, 12%, 22, 24, 32, 35, or 37% tax bracket based on your income level from your AGI. And so dependents, prior to 2017 Jobs Act, uh, exemptions could be taken for yourself, your spouse, and any dependents. And so these exemptions, again, are gone. However, dependents are important for credits and head of household status. So a dependent can qualify as either a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. A qualifying child. And so a qualifying child dependency allowed when six steps are met, six tests are met. And so the relationship test, domicile test, age test, joint return test, citizen test, and self-support test. And so under the relationship test, a child is taxpayer's child, stepchild, adopted child, sibling, half or step sibling, or a descendant of any of these. And so a foster child may also qualify. And so a child must be younger than the person claiming him or her unless permanently disabled. Domicile test. The child has the same principal place of abode as taxpayer for more than half the year. The age test. The child is under 19 or a full student under 24 and enrolled at least five months of the year. So I want to say under the age test is very important because sometimes people miss the part where they say that they need to be a full time student under 24. And they just they just look at the child's age and say this child uh, is not under 19 and they disqualify them, disqualify them for that test. So that's an important part. Joint return test. The child does not file a joint return with the spouse unless this unless the return is uh, filed merely to claim refund. So. 
in that situation, the person may not owe any taxes, but they, they actually had some taxes taken out of their check and they didn't make enough where they were required to file. And so if they did file, they will receive all of their money back. And sometimes they, they have to file in order to get their money back. So citizenship tests. A child is a U.S. citizen, a resident of the United States, Canada, or Mexico, or an alien child adopted by and living with a U.S. citizen. And self-support tests. The child who pro provides more than half of his or her own support cannot be claimed as a dependent of someone else's. Funds received by students as scholarships are excluded from the support test. Very important. What if the child meets dependency requirements for more than one taxpayer? So now you get into an interesting, um, interesting area. And so if one of the, the parties is a parent, he or she can claim the child. If both parties are a parent, then the parent with whom the child resides the longest can claim the child. So if that's not determinable, the parent with the highest AGI may claim the child. And so if no parents are involved, the person with the highest AGI may claim the child. If parents are legally separated or divorced, the parent with whom the child resides more than six months may claim the child. However, dependency can shift if the custodial parent signs the form 8332 and the form is attached to the non-custodial parent's tax return. And so you just need to make sure all of these different um, requirements, you have to have to kind of funnel through them to see exactly what is the situation on the tax return. So qualifying relative. Dependency exemption may be granted for a qualifying relative who is not a qualifying child. And so based on the following five tests, the relationship or member of household test, gross income test, support test, joint return test, and citizenship test. And so mind you, um, these tests are important to qualifying uh, relative or qualifying child because you're trying to determine in most cases if the person can file head of household. And that's very important because it's going to you're going to jump up at least six thousand dollars on your deduction. And so um, relationship of member of household test, the individual must either be a relative or a taxpayer or member of a household for the entire year. Um, broad list of qualifying relatives. And so gross income test, individual may not have gross income equal to or excess of 4200 And so tax exempt income such as Social Security benefits are not included. Support test, dependent must receive over half of his or her support from the taxpayer. The joint return test, again, dependents may not file a joint return unless it's merely to claim a refund. Again, a citizenship test, the child is a U.S. citizen, a resident of the United States, Canada or Mexico, or an alien child adopted by and living with a U.S. citizen. And so a taxpayer's child who does not meet the qualifying child test may meet the qualifying relative test. So credits for dependents. Deductions for personal exemptions are not permitted from 2018 through 2025 because they were suspended. And so significant tax credits are available. And so a tax credit defers from, um, defers from a tax deduction. A tax deduction serves to lower the taxpayer's income of the, tax, income of the taxpayer while a tax credit is a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction of tax liability. Thus, a credit is generally more advantageous than a deduction. So tax credits are covered in detail in Chapter 7. And so 2019 standard deduction amounts are presented below. Remember, we've already reviewed these. Single is $12,200. Mary filing jointly, $24,400. Mary filing separately, $12,200. Same as single. Head of household, special situation, 18350 And again, qualifying widower, uh, similar to married filing jointly, 24400 24, and it has to meet certain special requirements. And so additional amounts for old age and blindness, again, additional amounts for blindness for or over age 65, 16000 um, I'm sorry, $1,650 for unmarried taxpayers, $1,300 for married taxpayers and qualifying widows or widowers. Individuals not eligible for the standard deduction. Taxpayers cannot use standard deduction and must itemize if they're married filing separately and the spouse itemizes. They are a non-resident alien or they're filing a short period tax return. So special limitations for dependents. The standard deduction is limited for the tax return of a dependent. The total standard deduction may not exceed the greater of $1,100 or the sum of $350 plus the dependent's earned income up to the basic standard deduction of 12200 And we'll see this uh, explained in, a, in an example. 
So special limitations for dependents. So an example, as a child model, eight-year-old Penzer earned 17000 in 2019. He is claimed as a dependent by his parents. Is Penzer required to file a tax return? How much is his taxable income? So as a child model, Penzer is required to file a tax return and his taxable income will be 4800 So we take his earned income less the standard deduction and that's his taxable income. And so 17000 is his earned income. 12200 was the standard deduction. And so his earned income is 4800 And so if Penzer had earned only 9000 his standard deduction would have been 9350 the greater of the 1100 or the 9350 and so you take the $9,000 plus $350, and he would not owe any tax or be required to file a return. Again, special limitations for dependents. Uh, Jeffrey, Geoffrey, a four-year-old, is claimed as a dependent by his parents. He earned $6,500 interest income from a large bank account left to him by his grandmother. How much is his taxable income? So here, Geoffrey, a four-year-old, is claimed as a dependent by his parents. He earns $6,500. And so the solution is interest income minus the standard deduction is his taxable income. And so $6,500 minus the $1,100 standard deduction allotted to him, would get, given a special situation of limitations, would give him the $5,400 taxable income. So a brief overview of capital gains and losses. When a taxpayer sells an asset for a gain or loss, the type of asset determines the tax consequence. The formula for calculating the gain or loss can be stated as follows. So gains or losses realized equals amount realized minus adjusted basis. And so your adjusted basis is the sales price minus the sales expenses. And well, I'm sorry, your amount realized is your sales price minus the sales expense, and the adjusted basis is their cost minus any accumulated depreciation. And so the gain of loss realized is the, is the net amount that you received. The amount realized is, is the sales price minus anything that you had to do to get it sold, and then you're basically going to uh, subtract it from your adjusted basis, which is the, um, the amount that you have invested in, in that item that you're selling, which is normally the cost minus any depreciation. And so most gains and losses realized are also recognized. And so capital gain and losses, a capital asset is any property held by a taxpayer with certain exceptions as listed in the tax law. And so examples are stocks, bonds, lands, cars, boats, other items held as investments or for personal use. Capital gains and losses receive special tax treatment. The holding period of the asset determines the treatment. You have a short term or long term. Um, short term is held 12 months or less. Capital gains are taxed at an ordinary income rate. Long term is held more than 12 months and capital gains are taxed depending upon the taxpayer's bracket. And so you refer to table on page uh, 23 for a summary of the tax rates on long term capital gains. And so net capital losses are only allowed uh, $3,000 per year against ordinary income. Um, you may carry forward any unused balance. And so capital gains and losses are covered in detail in Chapter 4. But that this $3,000 per year against ordinary income is very important. And so here we have a self-study problem. Aaron purchased stock in JKL Corporation several years ago for $8,750. In the current year, she sold the same stock for $12,800. She paid a $200 sales commission to her stockbroker. So what is Aaron's amount realized? What is Aaron's adjusted basis? What is Aaron's realized gain or loss? What is Aaron's recognized gain or loss? How is the gain or loss treated for tax purposes? So realize it's $12,600. It's the $12,800 sales price minus the commission. So remember, it's it's the amount that they receive minus any fees that, that may have come into play. And that, that's going to give you your realized amount. Uh, the basis is the purchase price of $8,750. So gain or loss realized, your $3,850, that's your $12,800 sales price minus the commission minus your purchase price. 
and the gain or loss recognized the same amount, 3,850. You're going to take your, your 12,800 less the $200 commission and less the 8,750 for the basis. And so the tax treatment, because the stock has been held for more than a year, the gain is a long-term capital gain. So the long-term capital gain will be taxed at uh, 0, 15, or 20%, depending on the taxpayer's income. Uh, and net investment tax of 3.8% may also apply to certain taxpayers. So tax and the internet. So the IRS website. The IRS website is one of the most useful websites containing tax information. It allows the user to conduct common tax, such as check refund status and make a tax payment. Uh, the forms and publications search function allows the user to download tax forms, instructions, and publications available from the IRS. The IRS has also launched a YouTube video channel that features numerous educational videos covering a number of tax-related topics, including how to obtain a refund, how to file a tax return extension, an iTunes podcast, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook pages, and a mobile phone application, irs to go uh, and you also have Intuit Pro Connect Tax Online. Intuit offers tax prep products such as ProTax, LaCret, Le and TurboTax. And so let me say for the IRS tax website, it is an extremely useful tool. Um, the IRS website not only has very up-to-date information about any tax changes for the, for the upcoming year, they normally separate those in, in certain areas. We can just read the updates. They also have every form that you can possibly need. You can download in PDF um, format. You can actually, a lot of the forms, you can fill out the forms online and print them off or save them. And then they, they have detailed instructions for every form that's out there. So it is a very, very uh, useful tool. Not only that, but they also have IRS regulations and, and different things out there that you can actually uh, view. So electronic filing status, e-filing, two methods of e-filing. So using a personal computer device or tax prepare software or using the services of a paid provider such as a certified public accountant or a tax attorney who employs the IRS tax professional e-filing program. Uh, more than 90% of all individual taxpayers now e-file. In the future, e-filing will likely be required for most tax returns filed. And so, more, yes, a majority of people now e-file, everyone e-files their returns. And so you can, most people download software, well not download, but they use software on the internet for different um, different providers, H&R Block, Jackson Hewitt, Tax Act, um, Pro, Pro Connect that, that we have um, from Intuit that relates to our, our textbook. They use this online platform, fill out the return themselves and then submit it, or they go into these places and um, H&R Block or, or CPA or one of these other places, and they have them prepare the taxes for them and submit them. You also can prepare, they also have, to, they can prepare your own taxes yourself and then take them into these services and they will review them and then submit them as well. That's the end of the chapter. Um, please read back over chapter one, um, review the PowerPoint that's provided on Moodle, and I will see everyone Thursday. Thank you.